feet their right to live freely. Aaron Yeager has enacted a final strike against the world and his titans they move to eradicate the enemies of Paradis Island to dust. He is resolved to crush them for a number of reasons. 1. To secure the safety of Paradis Island, a nation beset by a world hostile to and allied against it in an unholy pact of dehumanizing hatred against its people, the descendants of Ymir. 2. A strong desire for vengeance. For decades, the folks of Paradis Island were penned up, caged in walls on threat of death by crushing titans that bled the world dry of hope and filled their days with content servitude. They were livestock, chicken, and were it some cruel machination of an unfeeling god or the unavoidable consequence of a natural system that thinks and cares not, then their pain and suffering would make sense. But this was not their case. Theirs was a torment fermented by men manufactured at the hands of fellow humans and precision engineered to grind their bones and spill their blood. For this, for his mother, for his dignity and human thirst for freedom, Eren Yeager wants the architects of their suffering dead. He will surely crush every enemy. The enemy of Paradis is the enemy of humanity. The third reason for now must remain a secret I will huddle to my chest. But if you stick around long enough, you will realize it yourself even before I directly verbalize it. People have arisen in indignation. Of course Aaron is wrong. Of course the genocide of humanity is immoral. This sort of reaction to striking in action. The commandment of death by a god of titans in a world that will not believe. A contorted antediluvian destruction, but without even an ark and its prophet to save the few innocents. Surely this is evil. Surely the mind that could write such a character and his world was coming to fruition is a fascist. In this video will explain why neither of those is the case. Why Attack on Titan is not fascist because its narrative bears the tenets of fascism at a surface level. Why, even if the story of this animated Japanese property features a nation whose reality adheres to one similar to that, which in attempting to sell their relevance, fascists would create and peddle to the masses. Why, even if that nation's people lived in a reality not different as it actually is in the context of this plot from any real world fascist state but was a one on one recreation of Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan, even with its elements glorifying military heroics, it would still be a reductionist interpretation with childlike grasping of nuance to suggest that the story of Attack on Titan functions as fascist or military propaganda. But I digress, this is for later. For now, our bones are mashed, the world is black, and Aaron is above it all. The rumbling, a force of unequivocal evil, stick around unless they set it together. Soon, we will begin by analyzing the context in the show and the narrative function a device such as the rumbling plays in it. And while you already prime your mind to think negatively and fight every letter I will utter, while you already build a fortress around your critical thinking to defend against anything that will contradict your strong moral standing on this topic, let me stop you there and be the first to say, peace, disarm comrade, and let us discuss at a table and not in a field of war. What point is there in debating a piece of fiction that denounces the lack of open-mindedness and misunderstanding than by being so hostile to each other's arguments? Let's do this. I will respect and appreciate without spite or malice what reasoning you bring to suggest that the rambling is pure evil. But I must request you do likewise. If you cannot, best you do not continue with this video. The intent is not to validate opinions and chicken away from challenging thought. I do not blame you if you feel the need to barricade your mind and activate your defenses. The intro to this video was deliberately structured to ignite the visceral reaction of rejection and disillusionment on the part of any who have ever considered genocide as a universal evil. I apologize for that, but dear viewer, I need you conscious of your own thought process and how your biases influence your reception to arguments if I am to get through. If you do believe you are capable of not knowing the answers to everything, 
including the questions of morality. Welcome aboard. Let's get to business. The titans of the walls will trample and rumble all of the lands beyond this island until the lives there are eliminated from this world. As mentioned, this video will start with the contextual background of the series and what the rumbling actually represents. It will then move on to the anti-rumbling stance, specifically on the basis of it being an objective evil and the weaknesses of that position. We will also go through the reasoning behind why people think Attack on Titan is fascist. And it is for the same reason, surprise, that the public figure Jordan Peterson has been branded a Nazi. Surprise is tough, I know. The video will also demonstrate that appreciating the necessity or relevance of something is not its endorsement or suggestion that it should be applied. Much as the scientist can theoretically discover an unethical means of curing disease and admit its existence without endorsing its enforcement, the stigma around open thought as to the evil of a rambling is fear. Fear that people might ever think it is ever justified to annihilate humanity if we entertain thought on such a topic. The video will then pivot to cover the consequences of the rumbling and its implications on our real world. And the big question which I will not answer, but which you will have the answer to by the end. Why argue against the evil of the rumbling? The situation on Paradis Island for centuries has been a desperate condition. Humanity being forced to live cramped within a series of walls, giant beasts roamed outside. Beings that seek nothing and live for is much, concerned primarily with eating human flesh for the sake of it, not for any nutritional requirement. These titans can only be defeated by a slash at the nape, and the cost of taking the one down can very easily be the life of several soldiers, if they're not skilled enough or lucky enough. Law, born to this environment, a psychopath kid, Aaron Yeager, and his mates. The under like addicted to him other than the unlearned to being triggered over nonsense on Twitter. And the attempted genius Armin who will go on to give obvious suggestions and commentary that the other characters will interpret as revolutionary and beyond even Donald Trump's IQ because plot says he's a genius so gosh darn it. These three become interested in and hooked on the freedom snuff. Aaron especially, his discovery of the outside world is the embodiment of the feeling Europeans must have been high on when they engineered race science to justify subjugation by sisters. As the story progresses and revelation after revelation drops, we arrive to the stage where it is discovered that the titans munching down on humanity, the threat we've gone to fear and abhor, and no more but fellow humans having a really, really bad day. Victims, in fact, forcefully injected with some dude's bodily fluids ill. They became giant flesh monstrosities released on their own kind, released to torment and devour the very people they wanted to liberate. And the pain of this revelation is carried heavily by the scouts, whose whole expertise and experience has been making salad out of them. Humanity does exist beyond the walls. Not only does it exist, they are the cause of this untold nightmare. The characters are forced to grapple with so unsettling a reality, it changes them. Eren becomes more steeled in his resolve to free his people, and especially his friends, so that, bolstered by visions from the future, he continues to march along the path to annihilate every last enemy. Even when the word enemy is recontextualized to mean humanity, the rumbling exists in this space, as the defense and defiance of the race of Aldia on parody from further brutality and possibly extermination at the ends of the world that fears them. And as a response to the horror and product of the damaged psyches inflicted on their national consciousness and on little children forced to watch their mother be eaten. Its implementation into a world with cycles of fate unending and ceaseless swapping of positions between oppressor and oppressed is an antidote to the strife. To solve human hatred by narrowing all the potential for conflict to a tiny subset of people left alive on one island. No races, no history of race war, no racism. It's like what if Hitler but red peeled and based and also blessed with a nuclear asthma. This idea, if not practically visible, is the reasoning in Aaron's mind. The rambling, unsurprisingly, evokes strong emotion. In the shoes of any ordinary person who values human 
life. It is the epitome of evil. It's not the ecological factors, the flora and fauna that will be wiped clean and the ramifications for the, of that on life on earth. It is not just the sociological factors, the loss of accumulated human knowledge and experience trodden underfoot. These all feed into the real question that bothers people, the morality of exterminating all humanity in a global genocide. The chief arguments from which all others stem condemning the rambling is that genocide is a moral wrong. Analysis into this is required. They bring up the idea that the rambling is unnecessary. The rambling, the catastrophic destruction of all humanity for the security of Eldia against a crushing coalition of old nations can only be condemned viably as a moral evil if there are alternatives by this reasoning. Fortunately, there are a couple presented in the show. Euthanasia by Monkey Boy, which would bring with it a localized rambling of some Marlian infrastructure, or the 50-year plan should bring with it a Cold War situation and further condemn generations of children to the cycle of Titan inheritance. The shadow of the rambling would loom always over the world and nations and peoples would live and negotiate in a constant feverish flux of fear. Doubtless to evaluate whether or not the rambling warrants the label evil, it must be ascertained that it was completely unnecessary and thus morally unquestionable. The alternatives Euthanasia of the Eldian race and an eternal Cold War style peace held together by strands of fear. Evil is defined as 1. Morally reprehensible behavior or 2. That which causes harm, distress or misfortune or 3. The quality of being morally wrong in principle and practice. Dear viewer, I hope you see all the above stated options to avoid the ramblings are also evil. All of them are not desirable. Because the world of Isayama's making, like our own, is too complex for a straightforward answer which bears no moving paths to solve the problems of the world. It was impossible from the onset for there to be any solution which does not fall into the orbit of evil. Some will argue, no, but we have scales here. There is a gradient with the Cold War scenario at the least evil end and the rambling at the extreme opposite as the ultimate wrong. In other words, there are forms of evil more moral than others. Dear viewer, our moral perception is not objective. No human on this side of the sky holds the answer to what is universally true and applicable to all cultures and people. Even within one particular community, right and wrong is not a giant solid block of intermittable truth. It is a shifting malleable construct that our societies can and have dissolved in London and arbitrary fashion. Yet I do not claim moral perception is redundant. It is relevant lest we slide into an unproductive version of anarchist ideals. What I do claim is that the process of evaluating which of the three options available to settle the problem besetting a attack on Titan's world is nothing more than an exercise in preference selection. People grow up in an environment of socialization which informs their perception of the world and what they value. And that is valid, indeed. Your comprehension and experience is definitely relevant, but listen to this. Through holy texts and the proclamations of authority figures, religions make moral claims about abortion, homosexuality, duties to the poor, charity, masturbation, just war, and so on. People believe these claims because implicitly or explicitly they trust the sources. They accept them on faith. This sort of difference is common. Many of our moral and political scientific beliefs have this sort of differential nature, where we hold a belief because it is associated with our community or with people with that we trust. Upon hearing about a welfare plan proposed by a political party, for instance, people are more likely to agree with the plan if it has been proposed by their own political party, although, interestingly, they are not conscious that this is occurring. They mistakenly believe that their judgment is based on the objective merit of the program other than because they trust the scientists. What is appropriate or not for you stems not from what is actually appropriate or not for you. It stems from your nurturing, how you've grown and what you believe. The European colonist Cecil John Rhodes, in rolling over and stealing my nation from its native kingdoms, used a tool in the form of the British South African Company. They liberated the natives, as you do, by trampling over human life and destroying livelihoods for gold and profit. No gentleman's honor just lies in deceit. 
Rawls believed the British race to be the flower of humanity, and so that excused the nasty slaughter and subjugation of, na of native people. Wow, <laughs> what a chad. Where was cancel culture then? I'm sure the BLM movement would have a few choice words for the dude on Twitter. Yeah, a nice strongly worded statement for him to read while he on his tea break from permanently nerfing some villages. The humanity was necessary, see, the savages had to be civilized. The United Kingdom had the powerful duty in the world as God's premier race. So, the natives were subhumans, incapable of building a cohesive society or maintaining a functional relationship to morality. African society, contrary to the reductionist Eurocentric perspective, was in fact developed in all spheres of human existence that constitute civilization. I mean, sure. Due to a number of reasons, we still hadn't gotten the memo that we could, we could build roads or construct cars and we were still killing twins and doing other abhorrent practices. But what human society hasn't had its fair share of barbaric practices at some stage of development. We had a legal system, believe it or not, that was engraved not in the pages of the book but in the fibers of our hearts. The culture was that and still kind of is, you do not live for yourself. You live for others too. We call it Ubuntu. All human life, chief or head boy, is equally valuable and we are responsible for each other. Our traditional courts of justice with their supervising officers and elders ruled by this ethos. Even the chief was reminded by a proto-democratic system where the elders reminded him that he drew his power from the people and it was to them his power was ultimately responsible. They would use idioms reminding him that he would only be respected and followed so long as he held everyone with equality. No wonder the death sentence wasn't a thing believed to be just. The worst punishment that could be given for in, to an individual for any crime in a society so interlinked and reliant on each other was abolishment from the community. Surprise! The perception of the wild subhuman beast incapable of human reasoning, compassion or construction did not exist. Not in Africa, not in Asia. Not anywhere. Oh, scary. Gee, I wonder. Almost like Western media never bothered to understand and actively discarded the humanity and impressive aspects of the cultures they sought to subdue so as to benefit from their resources. Can the unspeakable? Suggesting that the despised native Africans were capable of an achievement on the scale of Great Zimbabwe. His conclusions were dismissed out of hand by Rhodesia's white government. So volatile were the passions unleashed by MacIver's findings that it would be more than two decades before another qualified archaeologist was allowed onto the site. And the scars have lasted. Even today, public consciousness on the pre-colonial Africans is still largely fueled by the racist publishing and reports of resource-greedy colonists. The death penalty came with the Europeans who used it and several other means of force to teach our people to value skin and class divisions. Through apartheid regimes and racial subjugation, they left us with the Roman Dutch system of law, which we still largely use although we've adopted some form of civil law which still derives many of its concepts from Roman Dutch law. It is a law system which opposes many of the cultural, moral beliefs of the people operate with and so fails to efficiently be applicable, especially to the rural communities comprising over 60% of the population of my specific country. In some states, the dual legal system is in use. Whereby to compensate for this, two different branches of morality are catered for by the same government. The traditional courts overseen by the traditional leaders and the civil law system overseen by western versions of the magistrates, judges and the like. Both systems operate as viable arenas by which to seek justice. Two distinctly different moral codes. Tell me, is it possible to determine which of these two is the objectively moral or legal structure? How can we be sure we are not simply affirming our own socialization and beliefs in making that distinction? There is a subset of whatever audience eventually comes across this video that knows the tale I speak of too intimately. If your nation was ever subjugated, your people made rest and your culture diluted and demonized, if your people were made inhuman, unfeeling and incapable of positive contribution and growth, in other words, if they were made devils, I have demonstrated how the devils on Africa had a moral system that did not oblige with the 
heroes from Europe. So you understand that our systems diverge deeply and at times they oppose each other viciously. To claim Aaron's actions are more evil than the alternatives is to do little more than to reveal your own moral foundation and enlightenment. One country that neighbors mine is legalized euthanasia in a certain limited context, mercy killing, the termination of life for someone who, for example, is in a coma that may, they may not recover from is allowed there. But in my country, it is not. Which nation is more morally upstanding? On the one hand, the cost incurred by a struggling family keeping that person alive who may never recover. Loves being pain is unsustainable when kids need feeding and bills need paying. Plus the time. As an African, one day spent away from swinging through the forest like Tarzan to hunt for ticks and lies to tend to someone in a vegetative state is time you cannot afford. On the other hand, this is human life. Surely, so long as the person is not actually dead or their condition is stabilized, taking away their life is a violation of their right to be. Both these arguments are valid. So which nation is right? Teach me without treating your own religious, social and political grounding as the bedrock of the universe for all people, and I will listen. Ren's actions are evil, but more evil than the other two options. Please explain why to you a cold war of fear and terror which most likely would inevitably result in continuous wars for future generations accumulating in the rambling anyway, is just. So surely, so long as people get an additional 20 years alive, the rambling is, is viable, I hear you say. Remember, the argument I am making is not that the rambling was necessary or unnecessary. Either way, the true argument here is that a blanket assertion that the rambling is evil without recognition or that with downplaying of the darkness in the other available paths is redundant. I appreciate that colonialism, albeit being a major intrusion into and disruption of African cultures that were developing at their own pace, in some instances being in the early stages of indigenous industrialization as with the West African city-states, so to speed run a process that ought to have been allowed to occur naturally, lest it bring devastating social and economic consequences that the continent is still suffering from, was a distinctly evil process from the perspective of the people who endured it. Much like to the cushion, the politician smoking a pipe and reading reports of the senseless brutality of the savages to their own kind and the scientific impossibility that such creatures could develop themselves without outside assistance. It would have seemed evil not to intervene to help these poor godforsaken savages from tearing themselves to bits. To the white man, it would have been the white man's burden to assist these broken things. But at the end of the day, colonialism brought with it its benefits alongside its evil. Paved roads, cities, medical facilities, development was indeed speedrun. Sure, Africa did not get the chance Japan got by virtue of how, of just how much easier this dark continent was to access. So development was bulldozed over our heads, even when it crippled and stifled growth in the long term. Two moral possibilities from two divergent perspectives. Colonialism was a necessary evil. Colonialism did more harm than good. And the truth? Well, the truth is the observable reality on the ground untouched by the tinted glass of the biased viewer. The truth is always is immensely nuanced and requires more than a simple moral approval or condemnation. In the case of this Japanese fiction, there is little difference in the terms of moral complexity from that question. Erin is not Cecil John Rose, and the rambling is not colonialism. What the rambling is, however, is a response to an existential crisis by a people that have for centuries been subjugated and oppressed and taught to think of themselves as refuse. A response to a cruel cycle of oppression that is now beyond the repairing capacity of mere words, racism embedded into the DNA of the world. And that's the truth on the ground in this context. To decide the extent to which the response is valid or unmerited, to weigh good and evil slides into the territory of our own moral background and upbringing. You understand now, don't you? Let me explain again for the esteemed British. Britannia rules the waves carries with it a lot more implications than the ingenuity and gallant fighting spirit of your people and the power of your little island. Britannia rules the waves certainly means something interestingly different for the slave huddled like a beast in the cage above the seas as he is held far from home, squashed in the squalor of his own defecation and urine. Again, I will rephrase for the Americans, freedom of one people is the oppression of another.
So, let's say a story depicts this reality. Does it become fascist? Is attack on Titan fascist? If a piece of work demonstrates the aforementioned moral grey by not outright condemning immoral character action as evil, even if its creator comes from a culture distinctly different than our own, is the work guilty of the evil it exhibits in its characterization and in its plot? In other words, if a piece of fiction being specific, if Attack on Titan never explicitly shows condemnation for the rise of the fascist Hagarist outfit and their plan to rumble humanity, is Attack on Titan fascist? By plot, I just mean if the story concludes with the fascist victory, if fascist characters are ever in the right, if the military or of a military dictatorship is glorified in the plot. Even if a fascist society is merely demonstrated to operate and be necessary to ensure the survival of a people in the context of the story, is the story fascist? Does it condemn the anime to be military or fascist propaganda? No. Attack on Titan is neither fascist nor military propaganda. The first reason is plain, and it even operates within the faulty reasoning suggested by the idea that stories with fascist main characters equals stories that are fascist. Isayama's story condemns Eren's action th through placing more morally upstanding characters in active resistance to his plan and framing them as the heroes. Attack on Titan demonstrates the disadvantages of military dictatorship at the same time that it justifies its necessity to the people of Eldia. Attack on Titan glorifies the military heroics of the scouts but also shows the horror of war and the dysfunctional nature of its leadership. If Attack on Titan is attempting to tell a fascist narrative to bolster fascist ideology, then Isayama is a very poor writer. If it is an intricate and realistic fiction that understands morality as we discussed it earlier, it is bold enough to demonstrate that Isayama is a brilliant writer. I will leave the dear viewer to make their own evaluation on which is which. A poorly written fascist story that somehow has sold millions of copies or a brilliantly written exploration of morality that has obviously sold millions of copies. It's not perfect, of course, as with all animes, the characters will make that grasping sound and clench their fist while outwardly explaining exactly what their feelings are and what their ideals and motives are, but still that can be ignored because some of the individual acts here are phenomenal. Eren Yeager, Jean, Reiner, and peak best girl. The plot is tight and overshadows the weaker aspects of the characterization, so it doesn't matter much. I mean, even Armin, who initially had strong appeal due to, due to his personality, being a unique mixture of both courage and cowardice, but then became bland wannabe genius of the series. Really, his plans were just occasionally spotting out obvious observations that any reasoning human with a brain should be able to see. But his most engaging moment yet. His opposition of Eren in the face of the former's verbal abuse of Mikasa was excellent. Characterization is as it was an action that indicated choice to diverge from even Eren when he is in the wrong. But I digress before this video becomes character analysis. The point is there's no Attack on Titan's narrative progression does not even conform to a 100% fascist reading which would render it as any useful form of propaganda. If you think it is fascist because our protagonist and focal character is fascist, then I must insist, dear comrade, that you are wrong. You can find out why by taking one afternoon literature class somewhere. Have a nice day. But the real argument I seek to make concerning this idea is, even if the story of Attack on Titan did feature a plot that follows all the bits of a story that would be the kind of thing written by either Hitler or Mussolini, that still would not condemn it to being fascist propaganda inherently. Pay attention to this next quote that we don't we often don't know why we have the thoughts, emotions and fears that we do. We are not consciously aware of why we think and feel in the ways we do. Our subconscious mind rules the majority of our lives. So when we have things that are unhealed within us, those things are often what are driving our thoughts, feelings and behaviors. We are acting out of fear rather than faith. We are manifesting out of pain rather than strength and self-assuredness. We can become con more conscious of the fears stored in our subconscious mind by paying more attention to our triggers, our emotional responses and our reaction to stress. How do we react when something bothers us? How do we respond to people who challenge us? Did you catch that? 
I believe it is a subconscious fear that accepting stories that may even hint towards a fascist flavor is endorsing the idea of fascism itself. When this couldn't be further from the truth, we fear that recognizing a narrative can follow a character who is ideologically fascist and have his actions and decisions justified in the context of that specific plot, even without the work itself being an endorsement of fascism. It will be opening the door to fascism. Comrade, that is not what we are doing. It is the same with people who agree that by virtue of Dr. Jordan Peterson occupying a position where he sees the solution to world issues not being the fault of systems and the political environment, but that of individuals, he is a Nazi. Because that is exactly what a fascist regime would argue in attempting to keep people oppressed. The leap in reasoning is that because the doctor seeks to uphold the conditions of society which are comfortable for a man of his particular race and class, conditions which would benefit any fascist state which existed or does exist or may exist, because, because this particular goal of his and dissatisfaction is something that would likely align with those of a fascist, it must mean he is willing to hold one group in perpetual oppression, and thus, intentional or not, he is a Nazi. Haha, <laughs> big brain. This is contorted reasoning that frankly should belie anyone who even moderately understands what fascism is. Firstly, stop calling him a Nazi. That's the wrong word. You mean fascist. Fascist with a small f, not the capital. Even then, a person can desire a fa an, out an outcome in society that lines up with what a fascist would also want and not be a fascist. What's the difference in motivation behind why Jordan Peterson would not want or does not believe social societal issues require a change of system? I do not know. I'd guess the concept of order he always stresses and his ideas on why chaos is antithetical to a functioning society. On the other hand, fascists would not want change so as to maintain power, questioning the system entails questioning the central authoritarian government. A person can desire social justice and not be a communist. A person can desire meritocracy and not be a misogynist. They go off in color. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I went to Queen's University a week ago, and there was a lot of noise and, and horror around that, you know, that the people who were decrying my visit set up coloring book stations so that people could be comforted because, you know, the evil professor was coming to talk. It's like, <laughs> and you know, as a clinician, and Haidt knows this as well, and all the clinicians worth their salt know this, the worst thing you can do for someone who's anxious is overprotect them. It makes them worse. If you feel this, his stance superficially resembles that of a fascist, take, take the situation for what it is. Mind your moral bias in your attempting to contort the man to be a Nazi when he is not. Are you even aware of the components of fascist ideology? A piece of fiction can only be fascist propaganda if it actively goes against the essence and spirit of this idea captured in, the, in an essay by John Stuart Mill. The principle is, the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty or action of any of their number is self-protection. That the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. The work must justify and approve intrusion in the rights of the individual for the sake of the good of an authoritarian hierarchical government. I did not say it must feature those, I said it must justify and approve of those elements. Not from the perspective of a character in a manner that makes sense, but as a literary work with a purpose. They must be incorporated the myth of the, of the nation into this, which brings with it the need to bend together against an outward force. Note, the self-protection of the state typically means the government exercising horizontal, the horizontal powers of the state apparatus against an unwilling or willing populace. An attack on Titan, the political organizations that fit this description are distinctly the Egarist militia and the nation of Mali. They are featured and they operate as you would expect, but critically, the work itself, the manga, the anime, maintains a distance from their political ideals, presenting them as a detached observer, rather than framing them as the ideal. To frame them as ideal without the perspective of being from a character in the work, but as a political statement by the work itself, is what would qualify Attack on Titan as a fascist. Clearly, this is not the case. Mali's actions are presented and as, as they are and not glorified. And countless characters lament the evil of that country. Same with the Egoists. 
However, the most crucial thing is to identify a fascist way. It must allow for the erosion of the rights of the individual and make the case that the state can exercise its limitations of those rights without restriction even beyond what is reasonable. For even in real life, rights are not absolute. The state has the power to limit them, but the limitations must not be unreasonable. Yes, your country is permitted by law to limit your rights given certain circumstances which include national emergency and war. What differentiates fascism is the eradication of the idea that the limitation must be reasonable and proportionate to the challenge to be addressed. You understand now? A pro-fascist piece of media is one that advocates that it is always necessary and permissible for the state to cross any boundary for its own protection. If a story is in agreement with the government that to erode the rights of the citizens for, a national, for national survival, as early Attack on Titan does, and if it demonstrates that the limitations placed on the subject of the state are necessary and not excessive, as Attack on Titan does, it is not fascist. Even later, when Paradis Island does become fascist, it is not the work by the government of Paradis Island. If a piece of fiction tells a story from the perspective of a fascist glorifying and describing the events as the fascist would glorify and describe, it, it would still only be fascist if it advocated that the erosion of personal liberties is always justified no matter what, this, what excesses the state takes and not, arguing, and not from the point of view of the character. And yet, if it challenges its fascist group by presenting and framing the actions as evil when they are evil, are we truly dense enough to continue suggesting it is fascist propaganda? A writer can write a piece of fiction following and humanizing fascist, communist, anarchist, and, or even YouTube commenters without being lost in their evil or agreeing to their beliefs. It is gold being a good writer. And it is gold being able to think. If we allow our subconscious fears of fascism to convince us that such stories ought not to be told, we sense a vital medium of exploration and delving deep into analysis of what motivates darkness. No one can save the Eldian Empire. No one but you. When it comes to the military propaganda, I'd like you to watch a short segment from this clip. Here is a situation where the Russian tanks are storming a base belonging to the Japanese Imperial Army. As they storm, they are presented as a core monolithic force that marches in a wall of steel against these obviously very humanized and bold defenders. Portrayed as self-sacrificing and disciplined, they are to be taken as their military heroes. They, their charge against the tanks sees them sacrificing themselves in devotion, bordering on the insane. They are zealous and courageous truly worthy of the mentor of Samurai. Glory of the Empire. It looks cool. This is glorification. This is exactly what would be condemned as fascist propaganda for Imperial Japan. Now, watch as the video performs a magic trick. Blink and you might miss it. Commander has become little more than an insane maniac. The sacrifice and devotion that was but moments ago being glorified becomes portrayed as a horrific and pointless waste. A meat grinder shrine to the gods of fertility, sacrificed with haste. He recognized the utter devastation and reality of war. Anyone still think this is pro fascist propaganda? Raise your hand. Okay, now here's the news. Find yourself an anti fascist tree, comrade. Hey, wait, a military that starts off performing incredible feats of heroic sacrifice and glorifying fights accompanied by swelling action music but ends up being shown in an increasingly negative light until the earlier, the earlier glorification is now recontextualized in an uglier light. In Attack on Titan, this is the exact same story. How can you accuse a development in the plot that questions the righteousness of its own military as being military propaganda for the remilitarization of Japan? I'll tell you how. Fear. Just as you fear and resist the proposition that Eren's actions may not be evil, you fear to accept that this show may not actually be fascist or military propaganda. But the only way to learn is to accept where there may be gaps in our understanding and back towards patching them. Not by hunkering down deeper. Our moral ideals are products of our realities. Is the rambling really better than the Cold War or euthanasia? Is Aaron evil? Or is it the whisper of the society that molded you?
Reniega is in action to a final strike against the world and his titans they move to grind the enemies of Paradi Island to microscopic particles. His iron resolve to crush them is that of a teenager who does not understand what morality is but still acts on it, like many of us. Confused and running out of time, desperate not to leave his friends to inevitable death and doom at the hands of a cruel world, Irene wants to ramble all humanity to dust. It is a sociological question. It is a psychological question. It is a moral conundrum. While I personally hold it as evil to kill all humanity, I do not believe my perception of morality is absolute. And so, to condemn his actions as complete evil is nothing more than an expression of my perception. The rambling is evil, but only in the social political environment I have agreed to adhere to. Before my words are mangled and my will misconstrued, hear this, I still believe we can judge evil, but we can still hate. Hate of our perceptions of what it is, is all that informs our every actions anyway. But recognizing the limitations of our moral understanding, let us not make a bronze idol out of hate. If we allow it, it will seep into our treatment of each other. God keep you, and let us pray that the end project of humanity is not indeed the rambling.